Professor Paula Capolero obtained her PhD from MIT in the Department of Nuclear Science and Engineering in 2006. In 2009, she came back to MIT's Nuclear and Science Engineering Department, where she is currently leading the Quantum Engineering Group. She also has won the Air Force Office of Scientific Researchers Young Investigator Award. Professor Susan Hockfield became a member of, of, of Yale University in 1985, a faculty member of Yale University in 1985, and gained tenure in 1994. In 2001, she was named the William Edward Gilbert Professor of Neurobiology. At Yale, Professor Hockfield served as a Dean of Graduate School of Arts and Sciences and as Provost. From December 2004 through June 2012, Professor Hockfield served as President of MIT. She now continues at MIT as a professor in neuroscience. Professor Barbara Liskov got her PhD from the Computer Science Department at Stanford in 1968. She led the project developing the operations, Operating Systems Venus and has also developed the probing, Programming Languages CLU in Argus. In 2009, she received the Turing Award from ACM for her work contributing to the development of the object-oriented programming. Professor Molly Potter did both her PhD and her postdoc at Harvard University. She then lectured at both Harvard and Wellesley before joining MIT as a faculty member. Professor Potter is a fellow in the American Psychological Association and was a keynote speaker at the Academy Colloquium at the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is now a professor in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT, where she leads Molly Lab. Today, our moderator will be Edmund Birchinger. I'd like to invite Ms. Professor Birchinger to the stage. Professor Birchinger received his PhD in astrophysical sciences from Princeton in 1984 and is now a theoretical astrophysicist at MIT. In 2002, he received the Buchner Teaching Prize awarded by the physics department for his classes in general relativity. He served as the head of the physics department from 2007 to 2013, where one of his main goals was to make MIT one of the best places to work and study for everyone. In 2011, he was on the organizing committee of the MIT 150 Symposium, Leaders in Science and Engineering, the Woman of MIT. He now serves in the Institute Community and Equity Officer at MIT. The panelists will have 45 minutes to discuss their thoughts on women in academia and 25 minutes of Q&A with the audience. Feel free to begin thinking of either general questions or ones directed at any individual panelist. Remember that following the event, there will be a reception with the panelists. I'd like to now turn it over to Professor Birchinger. Thank you very much, Chandler, and thank you to the undergraduate women in physics for putting together this wonderful event, honoring both the generosity and spirit of one of our leading faculty members at MIT and the broader theme of support and advancement of women in science, engineering, and the academy more generally. I'd like to ask the, each of the panelists to reflect on her experience of Professor Dresselhaus and on the remarks which Professor Anakiva gave, sharing insights from others who've experienced Millie's tremendous uh, generosity and been impacted by her years at MIT. May I start with you, Paula? Um. <laughs> The really stuff. Reactions? Um, well, I mean, um, I think that I haven't really interacted with Professor Dessalaus uh, uh, personally, but uh, I think that uh, um, it's been also an inspiration for, for myself. I mean, I know her, of her work and uh, uh, this, this comment that uh, uh, Polina said about being fearless, I think it's a very good suggestion if you want to be a woman in academia. So. I thought it was a fabulous, fabulous tribute. So thank you very much. It was uh, it captured so much about Millie and so much about uh, uh, MIT. And uh, I think we all are acutely aware of the world in which we live. And it is just gosh darn hard to remember what it was like when Millie became. Wasn't she the first tenured professor at MIT? I mean, I, tell them, I mean, it, it, it was, you know, there were no women. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that I find amazing about Millie is you, you touched on this. I mean, she is just a bundle of joy. So how in the world could she have soldiered through what must have been almost insurmountable odds and just emerge as this just joyful, positive person who says yes to everything and is just um, by her presence is 
uh, more encouraging than just about anyone you'll ever meet in your life. So um, what, a, what a great person to have among us at MIT. Barbara? Um, well, I joined the faculty at MIT in 1972. My recollection is that at that time there were 10 women on the faculty. Mm -hmm. I'm in ECS in the computer science side. Millie was the first woman faculty in the department on the EE side. <clears throat> Uh, so I joined EECS always having Millie there one step ahead of mm. me. And she is a very formidable role model because not only does she do marvelous science, but she has four children. She has a very active life. So she is really something to aspire to and mm -hmm. also something to use as a model. Uh, sometimes the younger women have to think of her as a partial model because it's not really possible for everybody <laughs> to live up to everything that she does, but she is nevertheless a very inspiring model for us. Yeah. Yes, well, I guess I've known Millie longer than any of, any of the rest of you. and I'm Millie's age, so I'm astonished at her. She's, uh, she's, she's a superior role model even for people who are uh, technically her peers. And um, she, when I first came here, I was in a very different department from her and I took, it was a long time before I got to know her. Um, but uh, when we started being interested in the issue of women, that was around 1970, that we woke up to the fact that there were so few women undergraduates. At that time, 6% of the undergraduates were women. And Millie uh, herself realized that this was kind of crazy. But when we started talking with other people about this, uh, trying to figure out why there were only 6%, uh, what we heard was, well, there's a kind of a natural level. Maybe it could go as high as 10%, maybe. Mm -hmm. But you know, given the focus of MIT, well, you know, where are we going to find women who are interested in these kinds of things? This is not a place where we can expect there'll be more than about 10% of the population uh, of women uh, who, uh, who are relative to men who are c both competent and interested in what MIT has to offer. Well, uh, a lot of us sort of questioned that reasoning. And at that time, MIT then started a plan to actually try to recruit women. What would happen if we put out a flyer, you know, we put out some material that suggested we were interested in having women apply to be undergraduates? Well, sure enough, the number of women who applied started growing. And if you look at a graph at the number of women of MIT, it went steadily. It's just kind of a straight line. It's not even a log. It's just a, a straight, <clears throat> continuous improvement bringing us up to this number. Now we got to this number, I think 10 or 15 years ago. I'm sorry, I can't tell you where, where we started to asymptote, but somewhere along there we came up. Now maybe 46% is the national, natural number. I'm not sure, it might be 50. Maybe it will be 55. I think we don't entirely know, uh, though I think we're much fairer now than we were before. I think it's at least possible in fact, likely that we're underestimating the proportion of women who could be undergraduate, happily undergraduate, and gain from MIT and offer the world what they have to offer. So Millie, getting back to Millie, which is what we're about here, Millie was a powerhouse in starting a serious effort to increase the number of women, initially focusing on the undergraduate population, but then that spread into getting more women in the faculty and so on. So Millie, to me, is the, the sort of one of the sparks that it really changed this place for a lot of the people in this room. Uh, and I think it's just, it's wonderful that we have this occasion to recognize that. Mm -hmm. And I do say she can be only this partial, this idea of partial model, I think is right, because you really can't, expect that everybody will be able to do what Millie does. But that's all right. She's actually a very warm, normal person, as anybody who's interacted with her said. She's not, she's not, some, she's not sort of the Einstein of her field. That's not her style. She's a very effective, 
very good scientist, but she's, she's just a human person who understands people who, and who can deal with you on the level you come at her with. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm, we're just so lucky, lucky to be able to be in an institution where Millie could flourish and where she could change the institution she was flourishing in. The question this raises is whether the institution and the academy more generally has changed to the point that do we have to make special efforts to recruit women? Uh, and what are the variations among the fields? Uh, I sometimes hear from undergraduate women particularly that they feel entirely equitably treated in terms of opportunities, advancement, their, their career opportunities. And yet as we go up the academic ladder in science and engineering fields at least, there's often a decrease in the percentage of women at each stage. Are there lessons here from uh, Millie or from others that we need to be aware of and should be transmitting to our undergraduates? Barbara, perhaps because you yes, were involved in uh, reports on the status of women faculty in science and engineering at MIT, your perspectives would be really valued. So I'm glad to hear that the women are, t the undergraduate women are telling you that they feel that they have an even playing field because actually I'm not 100% certain that today that is true. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's good for the women to organize so that they can provide support for one another. Um, I think what happens as you go up the ladder is life intervenes and it's harder for women than it is for men because we, even today, are the person who provides the child care. We are the one who sort of sits at the center of the family and we also have to contend with our society, which is not exactly even for men and women, so that it's a little harder for women to make uh, progress. I think this is particularly true in the sciences where you have to worry about lab uh, work in the lab and you have to deal with postdocs and so forth. Mm -hmm. So the reasons why um, we see this drop off as we go up the ladder is because of the challenges that women face. And um, it's a, an issue that those of us in, uh, who've been interested in these, uh, this topic have been grappling with. How can we make it a little easier for women to move ahead um, and what should we do? The other question you raised was the question about the spacing, how women uh, in some fields are more numerous and other fields are less numerous. Uh, I'm in computer science. Computer science is a wonderful field for women and yet uh, young women don't see that. And that is coming from, I believe, from our uh, society mm -hmm. and from the gender roles and expectations that are imposed on mm -hmm. uh, women from the day you're born. Uh, I have a granddaughter right now, I watch her. She Right now she wants to be a princess. <laughs> and if you look at, you know, which is fine, mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you look at the messages that are being conveyed to young women, it's all about being pretty, uh, it's not about being smart. It's about finding a husband. So women have a lot to overcome mm -hmm. in order to get to where you are today. You managed to overcome those stereotypes. And computer science has a particularly hard job because of the nerd you know, image, which is, by the way, you know, uh, uh, you know, sent out from all the television mm -hmm. programs that are out there. So it's a really hard. So, so the, the unevenness in the fields is a lot of it is coming from society. That's a hard problem that we at the university can only make a little progress in. Yeah. Um, what I would hope to see though, and what I hope to see when I was working in the job that Ed has now, was that at least we would see uh, the pipeline moving along. So that in a field like biology where the pipeline is very large, you would like ultimately to see you know, a very large number of faculty, women faculty. In a field like computer science, actually the funny thing in Actually, you're not in biology, you're in physics. The, the funny thing is that the fields that are kind of smaller, uh, where the women are a small percentage of the population, tend to be a little bit more even as you move up the, hmm. the ladder, whereas the fields that are large, like biology, tend to drop off. So this is one of those mysteries. Can I, so can I, think I we have amplify a lot on what Barbara said? So uh, Barbara touched on a number of incredibly important and some very subtle points. Uh, when I was coming to MIT, there were many people not at MIT who were just kind of puzzled <laughs> that MIT would have chosen a woman to be president. 
And just to kind of test the stereotype about MIT, the misconception, I would say, well, you know, what percent of the undergraduates do you imagine might be women? And you could see them kind of like, you know, screwing up there, you know, just trying to, you know, figure out how far they could reach and they'd end up with, you know, you know, 15%. You know, I would say, no, it's 46%. They were astonished. And then, then they're almost, it was like almost an, an instinct, a reflex. They would say, oh, but the women are studying humanities and social sciences. And what I always say <laughs> is that at MIT, 85% of the women and 85% of the men major in science or engineering. This is so unusual, so unusual and so wonderful. And what many women at MIT tell me that you're going along feeling like, you know, you, you know, you're part of it. You're going, you, you know, there, there's, a, there's a, a group of women, you feel there's good support, and then you do an internship. <laughs> and you're the only woman. I, I mean, so I think, you know, Bar what Barbara pointed out is that our society is not yet where we need it to be. I would say things have changed dramatically since Molly and Millie <laughs> joined the faculty. Things have changed enormously, and there are far greater opportunities. And just, it, it, it is just much better for women, but we are not done. And uh, part of it, as Barbara highlighted, is just you know, the difficulties in you know, life and career. But I would say some of it is um, really what the societal cues are, and frankly, what the societal rewards are. I, I think that a lot of women drop out, um, not because they don't you know, feel they can handle all of the perhaps additional burdens, of, uh, you know, that, 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 that still fall to women, although that is changing, and it's changed dramatically over the last, I would say, 25 years. But I think a lot of women are just very practical and kind of uh, intelligent and perhaps just run the calculation that as you're looking at a career and you see basically the rewards and the path that men follow, and the rewards and the path that women follow, they do the calculation, they say, you know, it's just not worth it, it's too hard. I was talking to someone just um, the day before yesterday whose daughter went, was an accountant and great, a great mathematically inclined woman, and uh, she was working for an accounting firm and she realized that for her, her assignments were in Bangor, Maine and uh, you know, someplace in northern Michigan and the men in her peer group were getting assignments in New York City and Chicago and San Francisco. And she said, you know what? I'm out of here. Because, and I'm sure that no one did that intentionally, but there are many, many, many subtle uh, discounts that women still suffer. So what I would say to all of you is don't be discouraged. <laughs> the marvelous thing about Molly and Millie and Barbara and, and you know, even my generation is you just got to be kind of tone deaf. I mean, I think the reason that most of us made it is that you know, we didn't see those signals and we didn't hear those sounds because we were really focused on this amazing, fascinating thing that we wanted to do. And so uh, what I would encourage you to do is not pay attention. <laughs> to the signals from your environment and just you know, do the thing you love and don't let you know, the various small discouragements discourage you. Yeah. Molly, you have been particularly successful in training uh, scholars who have continued at MIT, superstar uh, women faculty. What kind of changes have you seen in their experiences as, as you go as each generation uh, comes up. Are, yes. are the challenges very different now than before? Uh, I think the, it's, it's interesting because it's been coming, becoming harder for everyone, men and women, to be successful in academics and I, in science, partly because it's su uh, such a competitive field. There, we get, even when the government is running, we're not getting <laughs> enough money for science. And, and um, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a competitive field. It's hard for people to get the kind of money to set up a lab 
that will be competitive in the field. And uh, so I see this, I, I'm saddened by the fact that through the years, it's become tougher in my view, not at, not at all impossible, but tougher to be successful with the same brains, the same energy, and the same motivation that we had before. So I think, uh, I think you do have to be excellent, and the training you're going to get at, at MIT will do that. Uh, but I think it is, it is it's tough to be at the top. Um, this is, I happen to agree with Susan Hockfield, don't be discouraged, just keep on keeping on. So even though I don't think it's become harder for women specifically, I think it's just the, it's harder altogether. Um, so I think um, one of the things I would suggest, however, to everybody who is a woman is that you find out there is a social science. I come from psychology of the behavioral type rather than neuroscience, uh, which is the main theme of my department now. And there is a lot of work that's been done, social psychology, to try to understand these gender effects. It's worth your looking at some sources of that to kind of understand the things that are, will happen to you over time, the kinds of, the fact that you'll offer, for example, a comment in a group, and somehow it won't be picked up on. And then a little later, some guy will say the same thing, and everybody will start discussing his idea. Mm -hmm. So you already said that idea. Why didn't they hear it? And so this kind of experience of being left back a little bit in, in social interactions is something you need to understand. So that's simply an example of the kind of thing that if you understood better, you would know how to deal with it when it happens. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have to get up and give a speech, but you could say, yeah, that's the point I was trying to make, uh, and then amplify on it. Don't give up your place at the table. This kind of, this kind of knowledge about the, what Susan talked about, the sort of atmosphere uh, and, uh, in, uh, that influences the role of women, you can find out scientifically about and, and get skilled at dealing with, and I suggest you do that. There is a, an MIT press book, for example, called Why So Slow? And the subtitle is The Advancement of Women. And if you, you can get this, it's in paperback. I hope they still have it in, in press. It came, it came out about, um, about 1999 or something like that, um, a decade or so ago, but it's still quite timely. So that's one kind of book you might want to look at to get some of the literature on this topic. Thank you. you in your remarks, emphasize, all of you really, the, the importance of um, personal leadership, perseverance, qualities that go beyond the kind of lab training and coursework that students focus on. And that calls out the importance of mentoring uh, and in supervising students, particularly graduate students who are making a commitment to uh, a long period of, of preparation for a possible academic career. Um, Paula, I had imagined that you think a lot about this in, in working with students and see these issues. How do you advise students uh, who are thinking about academic careers, and, and do, you, um, ha do you distinguish between men and women advisees when you're talking about careers? Well, so I have uh, just one female student, unfortunately, and all the other are, are men. Um, so I'm in nuclear science and engineering, and more than we apply physics, so I guess it, uh, it's mm -hmm. not the norm, but close to the norm. Um, I don't think that like I'm making really a distinction there. I think that it's more like every student is really different, and so it's a, it's a more of a just trying to tailor to each individual student. Um, I think that like having interacted with other uh, like women uh, students, and uh, sometimes I feel that they are less confident and maybe I'm just projecting myself into them because I don't feel that I'm particularly confident myself. Uh, but I think that like that's something that I try to tell them to uh, work on and uh, uh, and just if they're sure about something to just pick up and, uh, and be sure about it, not 
apologizing about what we are explaining in a perfect and correct way. Yeah. Barbara? Um, so one thing I did want to mention to you students is something I really think you should be aware of is that women tend to underestimate their abilities and men tend to overestimate their abilities. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was an undergraduate, I was afraid to talk in class. I was afraid if I asked a question, it would just show how stupid I was. It took me until I was a faculty member at MIT to realize that if I had a question, everybody else did too. Mm -hmm. It's good to realize this about yourself because you can compensate for it a little bit. And it helps you, I think, to, to realize it so that as you encounter situations where you feel uncertain about yourself, remember women tend to underestimate their abilities and if you keep in mind that you're underestimating, it will help you get the self-confidence that will keep you going forward. Can I say something about mentoring? Uh, I, I um, think mentoring has become a kind of cartoon. And um, my view of mentors is you should have as many as you can possibly assemble. And some will be formal, some will be informal. <clears throat> your life, your career <clears throat> has a lot of different components and it's not gonna be identical to anyone else's. And so you need to have people who can advise you on all those different components. Um, when I was uh, uh, at Yale, the director of graduate studies, women would come to me and ask me to be their mentor who were doing research in things I knew nothing about. And I said, listen, you know, I mean, if you're interested in you know, challenges of women in science, I'm happy to advise you on that. But you are so uh, sure changing yourself by thinking that I should be your mentor scientifically. So each of you should find an array of people who can advise you and help you and support you in the different circumstances you're gonna find yourself. And I just think it's, again, one of the things that I think women often do less well than men is building these networks of support, is just reaching out because they feel like they don't know enough to approach this professor or you know, your, your fear in, in approaching Millie to be on your dissertation committee. I mean, this is just kind of a standard thing. And I think more often than not, the women will say, well, maybe I won't do that. Because, but, and men will. So in most cases, people love to be asked for advice. Oh my goodness. Everyone finds this to be so <laughs> flattering. <laughs> you mean, I could help you? And so. And you know, nine times out of 10, the person whose advice or support or encouragement you seek will be delighted. You know, one time out of 10, you might run into a jerk who kind of bats you to the side. Brush that aside, just go for the nine out of 10. And I think that, you know, in general, um, students, all the students, I, I think, are insufficiently uh, aggressive, uh, gregarious in engaging faculty or very senior graduate students or postdocs, there are a lot of people around you who can help you sort through whatever is in your dilemma space. And don't constrain yourself to a single mentor. Yeah. Use the world to get advice and encouragement and support. In those fields that are still dominated by numbers uh, from men, what role do men have in helping to advance women? It's their job. <laughs> <laughs> Raise your hand if it's your job. <laughs> Can I just say something? So, I mean, I just, there was an awful article in the New York Times. There have been a couple of really awful articles oh. in the New York Times around uh, women in, in uh, science or business recently. And, and uh, there was a one about a week ago about Yale, and I know Yale well, and featured a phenomenal woman astrophysicist, Meg Urey, uh, who is just amazing. And I learned a very important principle from Meg. Talk about having lots of mentors. Uh, so we were, of course, everyone, you know, wringing our hands over what we're going to do about women in science. And she said, you know, the men need to fix it. This isn't something for the women to fix. I, you know, women can't fix it because they're not in the power position. The men have to fix it. Yeah. And so one of the amazing things that happened here was when the Women in Science report came out the men in leadership embraced it, and it would have gone nowhere if that hadn't happened. So it's important to have buy-in from the top down, important to you know, stay focused on it. Uh, but um, you know, the women can't solve that. But something the women can do, and I think, unfortunately, you know, women are set off to fix the problem, which they can't fix from the position they're in. 
And um, what women don't do enough of is providing support for one another. And I think some of that is just because, I mean, if you're fighting for life, I mean, you're, you're you know, beleaguered. It's very hard to, you know, build the bonds of, of community that will support and encourage one another. And I think that's just a kind of a sociological outcome of the conditions under which women operate, which is it's pretty, you know, it's hard. It's hard for men too, not to say it's not hard, but somehow uh, it seems to me that men know better about this bonding and supporting one another uh, than women do. I think it's just a consequence of the women being low in numbers and also, uh, you know, in situations that are just, you know, frankly hard. Molly, your reflections on, on that, on the role of, of mentoring and oh, uh, I think women the, and men supporting each I other? I think it's, it's, um, it's uh, mentors are essential. And by the way, having more than one, you know, you, you think of finding the advisor. Well, perhaps for a thesis, you have to have the advisor. But what you want really is to build advisors, people you can have contact with, mentors, people who will know about what you're interested in and, and help you out. And I think um, it's, it's a sort of a two-way thing. I think Susan has got a, a wonderful point. People really, people like all of us, I think, like to give advice. So it's not usually um, a negative to go to somebody and ask for advice. It's actually a compliment to that person. And many people will take it that way. Um, and so build on, build on that, not, not to be inauthentic and go to somebody you really don't like, but if you find, you think somebody has knowledge or uh, the kind of style that you want to interact with, don't hesitate to find people and talk with them and get advice. I, I, it, and then it's perfectly all right to say, and when you write me a letter of recommendation, um, preferably in the second meeting, not the first meeting you put that request. But um, it, it's important, in other words, just mechanically to build yourself some support group like that of people who can give you advice and also actually write recommendations for you. Uh, I sometimes will hear from a, a student who took my course, and the course has quite a lot of people in it, so I tend to not really know the students well, although I can know what their grade was. And I feel, oh, it's too bad that you had to pick me to try to write you a letter of recommendation to go to medical school or something. By this time, you really should have built a relationship with somebody by being a Europe in, in their lab or something like that and finding, you know, finding some basis to have a sort of a professional interaction with that person in addition to your formal advisor. So seek out. Um, people who could be helpful to you. Sometimes there'll be postdocs and people, if it's a large lab, sometimes they won't be the professor. But definitely finding people that you feel comfortable with, you can talk with, and you can take your problems to. And say, well, I, I, I don't know what to write. I, mean, I can't write this statement about what I'm interested in. How do I know what I'm interested in for graduate school? Um, and then you'll have a conversation and somebody will help you figure that out for yourself. So I think just seeking, seeking mentorships and, and cherishing those you find, that's very important. And that's a role that men can play. Absolutely. Can and, 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 and must yes, play. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think it's, it's great if many of those mentors are men. Um, and I think you'll be able to tell the difference between somebody who's only going to recommend his male students compared to his female students, you talking with him will educate him about the, your, the abilities of women as well as men. So part of your job in life is to enlighten uh, the other sex insofar as they don't fully appreciate what you're capable of. Barbara. I'm not so sure they're all educated. <laughs> but on the other hand, there are but, many you know, men the, here. The, the, the yeah. least educated. Hateable ones are eventually going to die. So <laughs> <laughs> that's harsh to say. At any rate, many of my male colleagues actually are excellent mentors for women, right. and I think when you talk to students, you'll find out who the ones are that uh, will be helpful. I just wanted to recommend a book, which is the autobiography of Susan Sotomayor. 
uh, not only is it a very interesting book to read, but she talks a lot in there about mentoring and how she used mentors. So I would suggest that you look at that. It would be educational. And, and in her career, as well as others, realize a mentor doesn't just provide advice, but helps you to make connections, mm -hmm. makes introductions to the leadership of your field, um, will help you to get this prime speaking engagements or the clerkship, uh, in her case. Um, so you should set as high standards for your mentor as you set for yourself. She was very, very uh, organized about finding her mentor. She thought about who is going to help me learn what I need to learn at this particular stage. And so I do think it's an interesting book to read from that perspective. Mm -hmm. What advice would any of you give to academic departments that are seeking to become um, more equitable and uh, uh, friendly, supportive of, of women in their departments, given the large variation that we've noticed across some of the fields of science and engineering? Well, so um, I think that it's mostly just uh, um, the environment, like how the people interact to each other to make it more welcoming. Um, I think that's like just the, the most important thing is to make sure that uh, uh, everybody's included. So that this occasion in which some woman say something in a meeting and it's not listened up to happen less and less and that people are actually aware of these facts and then so they can try to correct themselves. So it's a, it's a bit of an education of, of the men in the department on one side, uh, especially because often like we are the majority and, uh, um, and just try to be as welcoming as possible. Uh, it, it, it's a perpetual process. And there has to be real commitment, constant commitment, and uh, constant vigilance. And certainly having students uh, active in organizing fora like this and, and sharing their appreciation of mentors and, and role models sets a wonderful example for students in other departments and for faculty. So I really, again, want to commend the uh, organizers of, of this student-led event. Uh, yeah, I'd like actually, to can I just reflect on something? I talked to, um, there was a, another terrible New York Times article <laughs> <laughs> about Harvard Business School, the grade gap that got closed, and the article was terrible because you couldn't figure out what the heck the theory was or what happened. So I talked to the senior associate dean for community and culture, Robin Eli, to say, you know, what the heck happened? And she called out something very important. Uh, you know, I think you know, leadership from the top is absolutely essential. But she said part of what changed was consciousness you know, among the students. You know, the faculty, some aware, some not, but the students decided that this was ridiculous, that they would fix it. And so I think that um, you know, we feel often that somehow it's the job of the president or you know, the department. Had, it's the role of all of us, and you know, I know in departments where there aren't many women among the undergraduates, it may be harder to just kind of you know, say, do we really want to live this way? Um, but I think that, uh, again, getting the men <laughs> involved, they have a group at uh, Harvard Business School, that, you know, every class has, has man ambassadors, and the man ambassadors are the people, are the guys who are uh, uh, really leading the charge toward um, I would call it gender fairness, I don't want to call it equity or equality, but just banishing as many of those subtle uh, cues uh, that exist. Or not so subtle. Or not so subtle, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I want to attest to that, the importance of women helping men. Um, early in, in my term as a department head, speaking with the graduate women was mm -hmm. utterly transformational in my attitude about what I could <clears throat> accomplish as a leader. Not the importance of advancing women in science, that, that's been clear for a very long time, but they gave me hope. And in the same way that uh, Millie Dresselhaus has given hope and inspiration, our students can be the inspiration for some of the older faculty and faculty leaders. Mm -hmm. um, so, so thank you. I'd like to open up to the audience for uh, questions of any of the panelists. Uh, there is a, a microphone on this aisle, and I'm not sure there may be another microphone that uh, can be carried, but uh, we'd welcome your
conversation with, uh, with the panelists on the themes we've been discussing here. I have a question um, about mentorship. It's, it's really kind of a difficult situation when someone um, comes to you and you realize that they may be entering an environment which is, um, you know, has those subtle hostilities. Um, you know, that, that situation in the boardroom or whatever when, you know, your idea isn't important, but the dude's idea, which is just like yours, is totally worth listening to. Um, and I'm wondering, trying to balance the advice of kind of being aware of what's going on and realizing that um, it's happening to other people as well and kind of the notion that you need to just put your head down and enjoy what you're doing and not listen. Um, it's one thing that I've wondered when I've talked to my mentors and received advice from them is how they made the decision, do I, do I, give different advice to my women advisees than my men. I know their path will be somewhat different, but like, how do I approach that? Because for me, that was, um, that like was kind of the first door I saw shutting. It was, it was really helpful because I kind of knew what I was getting into, but at the same time, I, it was kind of um, my first realization that, you know, my, things might be a little difficult, more difficult for me than, you know, the guy next to me. Um, and I was wondering how you decide when, um, you know, looking at individuals and what, you know, what their qualities are or looking at um, any other factors, how you decide what kind of, you know, when you um, give someone uh, kind of a heads up and when you, uh, when you give them advice similar to that you would to a male. Barbara. So, you know, this is what makes it so hard, isn't it? Because when you get that negative signal, you don't know whether it's a negative signal that's being given to a woman but not to a man, or whether it's a negative signal that indicates that you're not good enough. I mean, it really is tough. Now, I think you asked a question about how we might advise people if we knew that going into that lab was going to be a difficult situation. Is that what you were asking? Because you were, and I would feel personally, it's very difficult for a faculty member because you don't want to say something like Professor X, you know, is well known to be, you know, not good for this and that reason. And by the way, these professors are often not good for men as well as for women mm -hmm. because it has to do with, <laughs> you know, it's not just women that get uh, uh, maltreated sometimes. Um, I have, but I do think you have an obligation to at least gently suggest that it might be good to go in a different direction. Uh, I do think that the students are very good advisors. Although I might feel that I can't say something about Professor X, the students have a network and they do know what's going on. So I do think that this is a kind of peer mentoring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Get connected to the groups and, and ask questions because these reputations are known. And it is really smart if you can do it to avoid stepping into one of those toxic environments. Sometimes you have no choice because it might be the only person you want to work with. But, uh, uh, you know, this question, what Susan said earlier about being oblivious, I was definitely oblivious. I didn't see the negative things, or if I saw them, I wasn't interested. Uh, in a way, you almost had to be like this in my generation because the negative cues were so <laughs> strong. If you were going to go in the ant, it was like you were swimming upstream and you just had to ignore it. If you can be like that, it's really helpful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Someone once asked me, I was describing a conversation I had had, and someone said, was he being condescending to you? And I said, you know, if I noticed when people were being condescending to me, I wouldn't be able to get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> of course, he's being condescending to me, who cares? <laughs> but I think so, there, there is a piece of that that is just really important. And then, you know, there are times when you may or may not be in a position to actually call someone on their, you know, on whatever it is, but I would say, you know, by and large, that's just not a winning strategy. <laughs> so, yeah, right. so I think being 
oblivious, but, but I'd love Barbara's advice of, you know, get other people's view. And so as much as you, you know, we're saying be tone deaf, you just, you know, follow your passion. Uh, it's often hard for us in that kind of mode to get advice, but I can't tell you how it just breaks my heart. You see a student go work, work with Professor X and it's a disaster. Another student go works with Professor X, it's a disaster. And another student comes along and says, I think I might work with Professor X. And you want to say, could you just, you know, take the data? <laughs> so, um, and you know, for whatever, you know, you're infatuated with the research. Whatever. So I, I just think it's very hard to balance taking advice and then, you know, this, you know, monomaniacal pursuit of the goal. So, um, and it's different in every situation, as Barbara says. And another aspect of that, though, is that the culture in a given lab group can be transmitted. Mm. And unfortunately, bad culture can be Absolutely. transmitted, too. So um, I'd like to advise students to think about their responsibility to themselves and their peers to stop this when you see it in action. Mm -hmm. And, and if you look at the problem as something that goes beyond yourself, then maybe you will feel motivated to, um, to work with other students and say, look, that's not right, and you shouldn't be emulating that style, um, because that does sometimes happen. And I think positive styles, in the, in the end, will, will win out, but that can be a long time. So gentlemen. Th th thank, thank you for, for those uh, perceptive remarks, and I want to turn to commentary from our computer, esteemed computer science so, colleague. So I find your remarks a little bit puzzling because it seemed to me you were equating two different things that are not the same. One of them was 
the rampant, and I believe it's rampant, uh, it's not exactly sexism, it's more like uh, glorification of a lifestyle that women find very unattractive mm -hmm. yeah. that permeates uh, the way computer science is, is uh, conveyed in the media and also it's in the games and all sorts of things like that. That's not exactly the same as the corporate world. Now, I can't really speak to what it's like in the corporate world, because I don't work in the corporate world, although I certainly have lots of students who work in the corporate world. I don't think it's toxic in the same way that that other stuff is toxic, but mind you, that's toxic the way bullying is toxic, and the internet can be toxic. You know, there's many toxic things in our society. Um, so I'm not convinced that it's as bad as what you say for the women that go out and work in the computer industry. On the other hand, it clearly isn't great. And uh, women in computer science and people in computer science in general have been trying to come to grips with what's really going on. What part of it is just the way our society you know, glorifies a sort of a hacker mentality and what part of it is real? Um, but that's about all I can say. I mean, I don't think that the students that we come out of our program who go into work into industry are reporting terrible problems. They actually are finding interesting jobs and um, you know, having a good career. So, well, if I might just make a distinction, I, don't, I think that the problem is maybe more severe or significant in relationship to these startups and yeah. the kind of youth culture, kind of hackathon type startup, entrepreneurial culture. I think the, the larger corporations seem to be better at mm -hmm. inviting women. And I certainly had a ton of women at the Great Talk Conference who were just you know, very solidly engaged mm -hmm. and happy. Um, but I'm thinking that that's kind of an indication, too, that there's a missed opportunity there. We only have, I mean, only 5% of the women are involved in startups, or 5% of women start up companies, right? So that, that's pretty um, extreme. So something is going on. Sorry, so there's a very big problem in uh, the entrepreneurial world and in startups, not just in IT startups, in all kinds of startups. And it's something that is getting a lot of focus here now. And it's been true for a long time. And it, it's another domain where women still need to get engaged at the level they should be engaged. So that's not uh, peculiar to IT. That's true throughout the startup entrepreneurial world. Corporate boards. Corporate leadership yeah, positions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're still, it's still work in progress. Yeah. Yes. You mentioned that there are some lifestyles that might be less attractive to women maybe than to men. I was at a meeting the other day when, in which a very senior professor was talking about, was telling a story about a new female, sorry, I should say a very senior male professor, was talking about a young uh, new female professor, or uh, female assistant professor who's trying to get tenure. And he was saying that she told him that she was planning to be an advisor for freshmen, which is something that faculty can opt to do at MIT. And he went on this kind of rant about how stupid that was, because why would you waste your time doing that when you're trying to get tenure, that's not kind of what you're here at MIT to do. And I know that the closest I think I've ever come to leaving science is when I thought that there were choices like that that I would have to make because the values maybe in the scientific environment are not that you should be nurturing and mentoring maybe, that you should be concentrate, you concentrate on your research. Um, and I don't want to suggest that women are always more nurturing than men, but I was wondering if you could comment on those lifestyle choices that scientists have to make, because I don't think it's necessarily a case of sexism or biases, but there could be sort of implicit biases in just what scientists and professors choose to value in their colleagues. Wow, great question. And a scientific culture, again, that propagates not just in groups, maybe on larger scales. Um, um, Molly? Sorry. I'm handicapped because I couldn't hear the question very well. That's a, my hearing problem. Yeah. So do, if you want to rephrase what the question was. Do, are, are there lifestyle choices that young people make 
uh, if they are getting conflicting messages about the nature of the academic enterprise. For example, a senior faculty member was criticizing a junior faculty member for becoming engaged in freshman advising, I guess. And a student hearing that felt, do I have to then not advise freshmen to be successful as a junior faculty member working towards tenure? Yeah. That's maybe a decision I don't want to make. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's uh, I can't really, um, it's very disappointing when a situation like that arises where you see uh, that kind of discouragement from doing activities that are going to be pro students. So <clears throat> I don't, I don't know, you, you want to avoid it. But what would you say? Well, so, so I would say um, you should not take away from this the message that going into science or an academic career means that you're not going to be uh, helping people. In fact, uh, what we do is extremely collaborative. We work with students at all different levels. Part of our job is to help them succeed. Yeah. In fact, it's a very human endeavor, even though there's this intellectual goal to sort of think things through clearly. The two things are not at all at odds. Now, exactly what was going on there, you know, who knows, because lots of things go on. Um, partly, there's a, a tendency here to encourage junior faculty members to focus on their research, because that's what gets them tenure. And then, once they have tenure, then we encourage them to spend a lot more time doing these kinds of activities. So it could have been as benign as that. But whatever it was, the main thing is don't take away this message that there's a sort of conflict between science and human right. behavior. Yeah. No, ab absolutely not. Yeah. I, I absolutely agree with what you said. Great yeah. question. Great, great answers. Um, the lady with the uh, Apple computer, <laughs> <laughs> the MacBook. Thank you. Um, I'm pleased to be here. I've had at least personal conversations with at least uh, two of, the, of our panelists, including moderators, so I'm happy to be here, happy to see you guys here. Um, I think it's an important issue. I um, am debating whether or not to become a professor somewhere down the road. Um, so I would like to uh, investigate that by asking the following question. What is the hardest piece of advice you've had to give someone as you mentor them um, on that path? And uh, what is the biggest sacrifice you've had to make personally? Or maybe the biggest sacrifice you've seen made um, along that path? Can I, look, so being an academic is a wonderful career <laughs> for women. Wonderful, <laughs> yeah. wonderful. There is a tremendous amount of flexibility. No matter what you do, if you're going to do it well, you're going to work like crazy. Um, so academics aren't unique in being an enormously demanding field. But so uh, when uh, my daughter was young, I turned up in the lab pretty late. I had the morning shift. My husband had the nighttime shift. And so, <laughs> you know, so he left work early to pick her up. And so I, you know, I, got a, I arrived and worked late. It wasn't a problem. Um, I had to, you know, I had, of course, you travel a lot as an academic. And you know, my rule was that if I was going to be away one night, that was fine. If I was going to be away two nights, my daughter came with me. I mean, you can't do that when you're on a, you know, you're off on McKinsey on a, you know, consult. So there's just a tremendous amount of flexibility. So I think, um, you know, many young women see how hard academics work, particularly women academics say, oh, you know, that's not for me. Well, I would say find a way to work where you're not going to be able to work that hard. I mean, where you can't work that hard, that's just not an option if you're going to be successful. The biggest, the most important piece of advice that I give for, to anyone who's thinking about going into academics is, do you really love it? And I put it another way, which is, is there something else you think you might do? Try that first. <laughs> <laughs> because it requires, I mean, you have to be kind of a lunatic about it. it, it the, the psychology, Molly understands this, but of intermittent positive reinforcement is really addicting, but it's just really hard to, you know, nine times out of 10, the experiments aren't gonna work. I mean, it's just, it's kind of like, why would you do this? You do it because you can't help yourself. So, you know, for those of us who 
are in this lunatic fringe. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I could no more have done anything else. I, I mean, it would have been, I, because I just had to do science. I mean, I just love the process of science. I love the interactions of science. I love the community of the lab. I, I love the academic environment. And so for, for those for whom it's right, I mean, it's just a marvelous way to have a career. It's a marvelous way to live your life. But testing whether it's right for you, I think is really important uh, you know, to embark on it. And frankly, a lot of people wring their hands over the attrition out of PhD programs. I think it's fabulous. I just wish, you know, if you, if you decide it's not going to work, get out early, because it is not for everyone. And there's no, you know, there's no shame, I think, in, in not completing a PhD. It's a tough route, but um, if, if it's the right route for you, I, you know, of course, I'm so biased about this, I can't imagine yeah. <laughs> a better way to, uh, to invest your energies in doing something that you love, but at the same time, you know, that potentially has enormous benefits for the world. Bravo, follow your, your passion and realize that science is a very human enterprise and it is a way of connecting and giving back to people. Uh, next question from the audience. Uh, yes, the, the gentleman in the second row here. And thank you men for, for coming and for participating, being Welcome. concerned. Hi, so I'm addressing my question to Professor Capillaro because on the face of it, it deals with, you know, kind of narrowly with a field that is near and dear to both of our hearts, quantum information. Um, but I would actually welcome input from all of you because I think, uh, I think it's, it's a problem that potentially could afflict any sort of new, you know, budding interdisciplinary field. And um, yeah, so my question is inspired, I guess, by a blog post I read recently, lamenting the fact that even though the field of quantum information essentially started um, with a division between, uh, you know, well, you know, older, well-established researchers who are nonetheless open-minded enough to enter an entirely new field, and also young researchers who are, you know, embarking on it for the first time. Uh, that, that seemed like fertile ground for um, a lot of the gender equity issues to, to start, you know, being resolved. Uh, and yet, the, the paucity of, of um, you know, active female researchers as a proportion of, of all quantum information um, researchers is as bad, if not worse, uh, as you know, physics at large. And you know, I, I was wondering if uh, if you had thoughts from your personal experience or from from observations you've made about why this is true. About maybe, you know, because the fact that it's a new field, um, it's riskier to enter, and therefore there's less of a safety net if things don't work out as planned. Um, kind of an analogy to the previous paint point that was made about startups, or whether you know. There's some other cause uh, that, that you think is, is holding back progress. I, I don't think that it's because it's uh, a new field, uh, but now it's not that new anymore. <laughs> um, so I, I think that it probably more reflect like the existing percentage of women in the general field uh, than, than anything else. So, um, it might be that part of Part of uh, what is quantum information science uh, has also to do with uh, computer science, which is particularly bad for, for what I hear. Uh, so that might be a reason that is maybe slightly worse than other uh, field. I think that like on on the part which I'm closer to, which is uh, if you want more implementation of quantum information, and so we have uh, like a big community spanning like uh, atomic physics and then some matter. I think that where the, um, the proportion is quite nice, um, not so much on like older people, but I think that there is a cohort like on of my age and, and coming up, which is increasing. And it's, I mean, I, I still go regularly to conferences and I look around and it's like, well, okay, it's me and maybe another person. <laughs> but it's sl slowly changing, so I'm sort of hopeful. Uh, lady in green. Thank you very much. Uh, you pointed out that women have to face more challenges than men in terms of social life, like 
carrying children or take care of children. Uh, I'm just curious to know how you personally uh, manage this. Is it possible to have a good uh, social life and having a successful person in academic? Do you have to sacrifice something? This is still an open question in my mind, and I just postponed thinking about it. <laughs> but I still don't have an answer to that. So I would be happy if I could know your personal um, challenges. Barbara? So um, <laughs> children take time. It, you know, it's not a, there's, no, there's no problem up till that point because you're just a person like everybody else. You want to make a little room for a social life. You know, because you have to realize that life happens to you and you can't really control things and uh, you have to sort of work things out and you have to make compromises in your life just like everybody does. Children take a commitment. And as Susan said, an academic career works really well with that commitment because you have so much control over your schedule that you can schedule things around the needs of your child. Um, all I was really saying was that women still today, although much less than it used to be, are the primary caregivers. It's not as bad as it used to be. And I actually believe you just decide what you want. You know, you have your work, you have your family, you want to have some children, just go for it. You'll figure out how to make it work. The big mistake is trying to plan it all out in advance and figure <laughs> out, you know, how am I going to manage all these details? You'll make it work. It does help to have a partner who shares the burden. Yes. So that's something you just keep in mind. But it's yeah. quite doable. And it's, there, I don't feel like I made sacrifices. I made compromises, mm -hmm. you know, where I had to choose between <clears throat> things I wanted to do and sort of fit them all in. But it wasn't a sacrifice. It was just everybody does things like this. No matter what your life turns out to be, there will be things like this. Yeah. I'd like to speak to that, too, because I have four children. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Millie, um, and it takes it does take time, but it's it's amazing how you can you can blend your children into your life the way you can blend your students into your life and your science into your life. You might have to slow down at cer certain points. For example, I took summers off during times I was with my children. I didn't have a wet lab, but that kind of thing might be harder. So you might have to make some compromises about when you're doing you know, heavy, ongoing, 24-7 kind of laboratory work. You may have to you work up to the point where you have a few postdocs who can take it overnight. Um, but uh, you can certainly fit children into your life. You can. I suggest the only thing I feel I sat, really sacrificed is I didn't get kids, kids, pets for my kids. When my kids wanted to have a dog <laughs> or something like that, I said, no, I guess we'll have another baby. So that, <laughs> figuring. So they, they kind of resent the fact that they grew up without, without pets. Uh, but we didn't. We actually had plenty of pets of the kind that can sit in an aquarium, like we had chameleons, for example, and other kinds of lizards. So uh, you, even that, you can kind of come up with some solution to. But I suggest you do have to cut some things out of your life. And in our case, it was really sort of social life. We didn't, we didn't socialize a lot. We just did our respective work. My husband's also a scientist. And, and uh, cared, enjoyed the children and let the children entertain each other. The, problem, the advantage of multiple children is <laughs> they, you know, if you're lucky, they'll get, they will like each other and get along well and support each other and help raise each other. So we were lucky that way. Our kids really, although they fought like other kids, of course, they also uh, learned because the most interesting thing around when the parents were busy were the other kids. And so they got into doing well with them. So I think, I think totally agree with, with, with Barbara that the idea is when you're ready to have them, just have them and sort of fit them in as they come along. And, and um, I mean, it is, it is wonderful to have children. Children are 
huge, and you don't want to give that up. But you also don't want to give up your, your science or your engineering or whatever, where your passions are. And you really can do. There is a way to do it, and there is a way to have it all. Um, all except you'll have to figure out what you won't do. You won't become a great golfer. You won't, you know, there are lots of things like that. You will have to give up some sort of organized sports like that. Uh, and uh, there may be some other sort of things that you would have liked to have also done that you have to give up. I should point out that since this is about Millie, we have to say that one of the things she did not give up was, was music in her family. Uh, music was very important to her. And I know that her kids, I think, also played instruments and they did sort of family music. So it, it is quite remarkable what, what you can still include in your life, even if you, if you decide to have children and a career also. And I, I urge you to go for it all and you'll find out what's least important. You won't watch a whole lot of TV uh, <laughs> until your cho at least until your children are grown up or maybe you're re retired. Yeah. Um, and, and so there are a few things that won't be there. But I think you can live without them and put the important things in your life. Can I pile Susan. on? Yes. <laughs> Molly and Barbara, you guys are right. So what I would say is that what the liberation gave us was choice. Unfortunately, the liberation did not give us 48 hours in a day. But boy, I sure could have used it. So, <laughs> so it, it's about making choices. And yeah. you can't make these choices in advance. It's only when you're in the heat of the battle that you realize I was on a panel like this just a couple of weeks ago, and one of the other women said, I don't cook. And so she doesn't cook. I didn't sew clothes. I mean, there were things that my mother did that, that I felt kind of conflicted about, and I just didn't do it. I mean, you know, I washed the dishes. You know, the dishes got washed in the morning. You know, so, I mean, there's just all this stuff, because after dinner was time with Elizabeth then to get her to bed, and then after that, there was time for my lab. I mean, so... You just, you just figure it out. But I think it's a mistake to imagine that you're going to be a great amateur golfer you know, and a great mom or dad and a great scientist. And you, know, you, 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 you will have to make choices of a sort that you can't even imagine. But uh, you know, Molly and Millie and Barbara are great examples of women who early on, when there weren't so many advantages that were provided, like childcare on campus. Can you imagine what your lives would have been like if you had childcare on campus? Um, but I think it's a mistake to imagine that you can do it all in the sense that you can fit absolutely two lives into you know, a 24-hour day. That, that has not happened. The other thing, ha you have to have a great partner. Oh my goodness, having a partner who's willing to pick up the slack or fill in the gaps, absolutely critical. Amen. Yes. I was wondering if there was a time when you uh, recognized a gender discrimi uh, discrimination situation that you were in that you felt like you dealt with well, especially <laughs> one where you didn't ignore it because you, you told us the advice of ignoring it. But how is there a method to go about approaching gender discrimination in a good way? Wow, besides simply standing up and saying, don't discriminate. <laughs> is, is that a good method, or is there other I, I think a sense of humor goes a long way. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that mm -hmm. standing up and saying something, that doesn't work. But if you can kind of, I, so I have a tendency to laugh when somebody does something ridiculous. <laughs> and and I, I think that helps a lot. The other thing you can do is to uh, get allies. Um, so I, I mean, this is something I've always, I, I don't think I knew to do it. It was just something I did. So I had developed allies at MIT. And if you're on a committee, mm -hmm. you want to have allies. And it turns out even without planning, you start to work together. And for example, if your ally is a man, and mine usually were because there were very few women for me to have allies, they can pick up on the things that you might not be able to say. You know, like they're the one who can say, oh, Barbara just said that. You know, it's much harder if Barbara says that, but if your ally says it. So allies help, a sense of humor helps. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, a couple of more questions as we're, we're approaching the, the hour. Yes. 
You can just speak loudly. <laughs> So, I, I mean, I think nothing delights anyone more than, it said, seeking advice. But the other thing, I mean, it's just so fun when a student has read one of your papers and says, could, could I, I, you know, I read your paper, I, could, would you mind if we talked about it? I mean, how fabulous that is. It, it, I mean, there's just nothing, almost nothing as much fun as having some student come along who's read your paper and kind of wants to know how you came up with the idea. And so as a scientist, you know, that's how I'd approach it in terms of finding other mentors. And, uh, you know, we have all these formalisms of, the, you know, people are on your committee and, you know, that's great. And you should be cultivating relationships with the people on your committee along these lines. They're on your committee because they can be helpful. Um, so I always, you know, I think, you know, women often go it alone when you could be doing it with others. And so using your curiosity as the direction finder for mentors, you know, in my mind, is just a great way to find people who become your allies. I think Barbara's got it just right. You want to build a network of allies. So anyone, when you're a graduate student, the people you are going to see going along, you need to be talking to them, not, you know, at long episodes, but a lot. When you go to seminars, and if you're at a seminar with someone who's on your committee, afterward you can say, well, hey, you know, there was, I had this question in the seminar, and I couldn't really get it articulated at the time, but can you help me understand, you know, what might be the answer to this kind of a question? So look for opportunities to have conversation. Build your allies. Build your network. Super, super advice. Yes. Sorry about that, running back and forth. <laughs> this will be the last question. Thanks, and thanks for your comments. Um, one issue that hasn't come up, and I'm kind of shocked hasn't come up, is the issue of race. Uh, and in particular, the drastic underrepresentation of Latino women and black women in the academy in general and in science and engineering specifically. Um, so is it right to think that the measures that have been taken at MIT and other places that have uh, improved the place of women at large haven't worked for black and Latino women? And if so, uh, what should we be focusing on? Important question. Really important question. And you know, we're talking about uh, a problem that you see perhaps here that's the product of um, an individual's history. So I think part of the problem is cultures that don't support women who are interested in science or math, don't encourage them. Um, frankly, that uh, have a hard time encouraging anyone to imagine uh, doing what we do here at MIT. So these are very deep societal problems. I frankly, um, and rather than say how few there are, I am delighted and astonished by how many awesome Hispanic and, and African-American minority women we have here at MIT. It's magnificent. And how we can get the news of their success back into their communities to serve as role models uh, for girls so they know they can do it, um, I think is critically important. It also raises the identity factor that uh, right. a woman from one group or, or another, in fact, all of us wear multiple identities, and we have to realize that there are aspects of who we are that we have to shape to our environment and get allies uh, to, to support us with, with those identities. So thank you very much for raising that, that question. That's good. Um, it's a wonderful one. I, I want to thank the, the panelists for this really wonderful, engaging discussion on the themes of Millie and her contributions uh, in mentoring and success of uh, women in science. And once again, thank the undergraduate women in physics for uh, bringing together this panel. <laughs>